The formal iterations of martial arts have been a part of human history for thousands of years, but the idea of fighting itself is hardwired into our DNA, which at least offers an insight into why we inexplicably enjoy watching one guy punch another guy for our fleeting, selfish entertainment. Until its mainstream inception during the early 1990s and through the UFC, the concept of combining all the best martial arts into a tournament was more of a movie plot than it was reality. So when the first UFC happened, it was monumental to say the least. And while some of the martial arts didn't quite perform so well, others shined and changed combat sports forever. Today we'll talk about those who spearheaded and tested their respective styles specifically in mixed competition on the world stage, influencing future generations of fighters within their discipline to carry their respective torches. I'm Jason from MMA on Point and these are the 12 most influential fighters in MMA history by style. Number 12, Kung Lee Taekwondo. As a child, Kung Lee fled his birthplace of Saigon during the Vietnam War, and due to being bullied as a child in California, Lee began training Taekwondo at age 10 and would become a first degree black belt. Despite not being a long or rangy fighter at 5'10 in the middleweight division, Lee used an incredible array of kicks to become one of Strike Force's standout fighters throughout the mid to late 2000s. Before Lee, almost no one was using spinning techniques successfully successfully in MMA, so rare that fighters' entire careers were defined by it for a long time. Shoni Carter. And it went as far as Taekwondo being actually deemed an ineffective martial art and a true fight by many, including Joe Rogan, who himself is a former champion, if you recall, in Taekwondo. These early people 2000, used to make fun like, of me. Yeah, nobody was working on that Everyone shit. is now, though. Yeah. Dude, people used to make fun Everybody of me when should, I brought it sure. up. I would say, you know, like, once people learn how to really throw spinning back kicks to the body, I'm like, it's like getting hit by a car. However, Lee would throw a spinning attack after spinning attack on his way to winning the Strike Force middleweight title and hold a 100% KO or TKO rate in his seven wins with the promotion to show that if used correctly, Taekwondo could indeed succeed in modern MMA. Today we see Taekwondo techniques used so often that we take it for granted paving the way for fighters like the Pettis brothers, Edson Barboza, and Uriah Hall following in Kung Lee's footsteps, and using its techniques to score incredible finishes on the sport's highest level. Number 11, Marco Huas, Luto Livre. Literally translating to free or freestyle fighting, this art was developed in Brazil during the 1920s as a reaction to the ever-growing success of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It was unique in that it was a no-gi form of combat, making it much more accessible to people regardless of income. As expected, Luta Livre and BJJ had quite the rivalry, which regularly featured anything goes Valley Tudo fights between members of both disciplines in order to attain dominance and claim effectiveness over the other. The seventh degree black belt in Luta Livre, Marco Huas, became a permanent fixture in defending and growing the martial arts reputation in Brazil, and he would put Luta Livre on the map as he won the UFC 7 tournament in 1995. Huas would go on to mentor the likes of UFC heavyweight Pedro Hizo and Hinatu Babalusa Brawl, who would most famously promote the lesser-known Brazilian martial art, which is still trained by some of the greatest strikers within MMA today, like Jose Aldo and even Darren Till when he lived in Brazil. Beyond that, the art is so embedded in the culture of Brazil that it reaches deep into the foundations of modern MMA itself. Number 10. Oleg Taktarov, Sambo Eastern Europe, and in particular Russia, has always had the notion of being one of the harshest areas to grow up in the world, breeding a uniquely tough and jaded population, which has translated directly into the martial arts throughout history. During World War I, hand-to-hand -hand combat was developed for the Russian military with an emphasis on technique over brute strength. Elements of judo, jiu-jitsu, and wrestling along with the striking arts combined to create combat sambo, plainly translating to mean self-defense without weapons. With the advent of MMA, Oleg Taktarov was the first to bring his sambo approach to the West, winning the UFC 6 tournament in the process. He defeated wrestling specialists and Luta Libre practitioners, and David Veneto and Marco Huas to display the effectiveness of sambo. If it wasn't for a successful acting career, Taktarov would have almost certainly continued fighting more regularly. He laid out the early blueprint for Russian sambo fighters 
leaders like Fedor Emelianenko and Habib Nurmagomedov to represent Russia and Sambo so successfully in MMA. Number 9. Lyoto Machida Karate Karate is arguably the most famous martial art worldwide, definitely in the West, especially as it was popularized through movies like The Karate Kid. And karate itself translates to open hand and originated in the late 1300s as a tweaked form of kung fu. And until Lyoto Machida took the MMA world by storm, you didn't really see any strict karate practitioners in the sport. Former UFC champions like Chuck Liddell and GSP came from karate backgrounds as well, but they pretty much abandoned their training for the likes of standard kickboxing and wrestling by the time they actually reached MMA. Machida is unique in that he almost exclusively attempts to fight with his blitz in and blitz out Shotokan karate style. Machida earned his black belt at just 13 under the tutelage of his father, who also just so happened to be the head of the Brazilian branch of Japanese Karate Association and would win the UFC light heavyweight title with a perfect 15-0 record, knocking out then-champion Rashad Evans, prompting Machida to proclaim is back! and Joe Rogan something less endearing over time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Machida era. He displayed not only his ability with techniques like his KO of Randy Couture that uh, Sensei Seagal taught him along with Anderson Silva, apparently. Anderson, after the fight, said that he learned that front kick to the face from you. Right. Well, nobody knows the kick. I'm teaching it to Machida and Machida Kun and Anderson and a few of the Brazilians, but we haven't really used it much yet. I haven't, I haven't shown it to many people yet. But also a perfect example of traditional martial arts in the modern era. The Dragon's karate style has influenced unique strikers such as Stephen Thompson, Gunnar Nelson, and even Henry Cejudo in modern times. And there's no doubt it was also an inspiration for organizations like Karate Combat. Number 8. Masakatsu Funaki Pro slash shoot style wrestling. This list could just as easily go to some of the big names like Antonio Inoki, Shudo founder Sayama Satoru, which also predated Pain Grace actually, but it was Funaki who really started to bring in massive shows in Japan that served as the most immediate bridge to future MMA giant Pride Fighting Championships. The other difference is that Funaki was one of the first true talents to reach the top of MMA, whereas the other men I just mentioned merely dabbled in it. For instance, he fought more than 50 times. Funaki founded Pancrase Hybrid Wrestling, yes meaning hybrid pro wrestling with real fighting, which explains some of the odd rules like rope breaks and initially no close fist punches. He did this in Japan alongside Minoru Suzuki, who also fought, but had mixed success in comparison just a couple of months before the UFC held its first event all the way back in 1993. Funaki brought in the stars of Japanese professional wrestling alongside traditional martial arts to compete. The promotion boasted some of MMA's early stars including Ken and Frank Shamrock and Boss Rutan. And what's also noteworthy is that Funaki defeated all three of them. He also trained and helped develop the organization's biggest stars from Japanese professional wrestling and otherwise. In fact, he was so good at training them that many of his protégés eventually began to beat him as time went on. Own successes and accomplishments both in and outside of the ring were so important, it's hard to imagine guys like Sakuraba, Tamura, Fujita, and yes, even Takada, mentioning him more for his influence than anything, making the transition to MMA in the first place and developing pride into the absolute MMA powerhouse it was. Number 7. Jean LaBelle, Judo. In 1882, Judo founder Kano Jigoro, I'm not saying that right, pushed his fighting concept around the world. And similar to Jiu Jitsu, it was focused on techniques for the smaller fighter that didn't require size or strength to do effectively. Judo became the first martial art to be featured in the Olympic Games. However, before Judo had become global, California's Jean LaBelle had already mastered the discipline. LaBelle was influenced by his mother, who was a promoter for combat sports and began judo at age 10. After earning his black belt, LaBelle won the 1954 and 1955 Amateur Athletic Judo Championships in his early 20s, ranking 10th degree and red belt in judo shortly after. Why a red belt, not black? And there's also red and white after black belt as well. Judo likes those extra steps. That's like a whole other level above super. Gene is most famous for competing in a mixed rules fight against professional boxer Milo Savage. <clears throat> 
Hell of a name. Most impressive. After accepting sports writer Jim Beck's challenge that all pro boxers could defeat any martial artist on the planet. So, LaBelle defeated Savage in America's first ever sanctioned mixed rules contest, which helped shift Western opinion away from boxers being the greatest fighters alive. LaBelle helped train Bruce Lee extensively, who would obviously go on to popularize martial arts like no one else ever did. He would also train MMA's most famous judoka, Ronda Rousey, at a young age and refereed the infamous Muhammad Ali versus Antonio Inoki mixed rules bout. Speaking of, number six, Muhammad Ali boxing. Before boxers were coming over into MMA and MMA fighters were going over into boxing, the legendary Muhammad Ali competed in a crossover fight against professional wrestler Antonio Inoki in 1976. Although Ali was not initially sold the idea on a fixed fight, but rather a pro wrestling match, the bout was evolved into a mixed rules fight as words were exchanged between the two camps. The fight itself is largely forgotten in mainstream western media, which isn't surprising because there really wasn't much action and there were extremely limited rules, but the spectacle translated exceptionally well in Japan. The fight inspired many more mixed style fights in the years that followed, eventually extending all the way to Japanese MMA itself decades later. But for boxing, even with restricted rules, Ali was the first to step out of his country comfort zone and compete in a mixed rules bout, which certainly paved the way for future boxers to follow in his footsteps. As perhaps the most famous athlete alive in his era, it's nothing short of monumental for his inclusion into the early building blocks of MMA and boxing's involvement moving into it. And this didn't merely inspire just those who began first in boxing and transitioned into MMA such as Conor McGregor, Cody Garbrandt, and Holly Holm, but also boxing's unilateral influence on the sport today. Number five, Vanderlei Silva Muay Thai. According to Thai folklore, the art of eight limbs, or for the uninitiated, the extra quote unquote four limbs, meaning elbows and knees, Muay Thai traces back to 1767 when Nai Kanantum was captured during a conflict with neighboring Myanmar, otherwise known as Burma. As a prisoner, the soldiers learned of his unique style, which would later be called Muay Thai. So he was pitted against 10 Burmese soldiers to test his legendary skills and earn his freedom. Against all the odds, Nai I would not only defeat all of them, but he supposedly KO'd every last one of them, granting him passage back to Thailand. Since then, on March 17th every year, Thailand celebrates National Muay Thai Day in homage to Kanantam, and the first man to bring the devastating striking style significance to MMA on the biggest stage was none other than Vanderlei Silva. Combined with an unparalleled level of aggression, his absolutely brutal Muay Thai dominated Pride's middleweight division, where he actually holds the most wins, the most knockouts, and the longest undefeated streak in the promotion's history. The Axe Murderer, which is perhaps the most terrifying yet fitting nickname in MMA history, honed his fearsome Muay Thai at the Shootbox Academy in Curitiba, Brazil. This is where he became the camp spearhead and played a key role in developing some of Brazil's and MMA's greatest fighters ever, Anderson Silva, Fabricio Verdum, Chris Cyborg, and Mauricio Shogun Hua. So while it's important to note that many have done it before him and others have arguably reached greater heights, like in Anderson Silva, it was his legendary and violent streak that changed MMA for the better and made others realize that Muay Thai was something you better know, at the very least, just how to defend it. Number four, Boss Rutten Kickboxing. The legendary Boss Rutten began combat sports as a young teenager in Holland. For him, it was a necessary reaction to being bullied. And after being inspired by Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon, Rutten trained in boxing, taekwondo, karate, but truly found his calling for competition as a kickboxer. With 14 knockouts in 16 kickboxing fights, Rutten was scouted by the Pancrase founders to debut in their new Japanese MMA promotion. And quickly, Rutten became a star. After KOing his first opponent in 1993, two months before the UFC had its first event, Rutten would go on to rival both the Shamrock Brothers, founder Funaki and became the most feared striker in Japan at that time. He used devastating open palm strikes to get around their no closed fist punching rule and became the most feared striker in Japan. Rutten would go on to win UFC gold against Kevin Randleman at UFC 20 despite the clear controversy there and has since been inducted into the Pioneers wing for the UFC's Hall of Fame. The number of kickboxers who have followed down this path into MMA is nothing short of an army over the years. I could begin naming but I wouldn't even get through a small fraction of how many of them have transitioned to the world's top organizations and as a result have greatly influenced MMA forever. Number three, Frank Shamrock 
MMA. Before Frank Shamrock, virtually every fighter was a specialist in just one background style. And if you're maybe a casual fan, it might be kind of weird to think of MMA as its own art, as it's inherently an amalgamation of other various fighting disciplines. But just as CrossFit combined various exercise routines becoming its own brand of fitness, so has MMA training done to the martial arts. Fighters now train this way from day one, as opposed to the traditional route seeing its genesis from only one art. Shamrock was the first successful fighter to heavily cross-train various aspects of martial arts and employ various specialists to train him. This was a revolutionary approach for the time, and Shamrock, along with the help of his new team, after splitting from his big brother Ken's The Lion's Den, became the UFC's inaugural light heavyweight champion in 1997, the first true legacy champion in the UFC to hold an extended streak of defenses with four back-to-back -back wins that was only broken by a short-lived retirement where he vacated his belt. This streak also included a legendary win over a very young Tito Ortiz before Tito would go on to build his own streak in his absence. Shamrock was widely considered the greatest fighter alive at the time. He regularly had submission specialists like the aforementioned Funaki in his corner, kickboxer and former heavyweight champion Marie Smith, and even future AKA coach of many, many world champions, and the organization's founder, Javier Mendez. It was an entirely revolutionary mix of disciplines at the time, driving the sport into the modern era. Number two, Dan Severn wrestling. Had Dan Severn's Olympic wrestling career gone to plan, he admits he would have never competed in MMA. However, Severn lost a controversial Olympic trial match in 1984 and again lost in the 1988 trials. This hunger for achievement kept his competitive fire going all the way until UFC 4, where wrestling was not even listed as a recognized form of combat by UFC matchmaker Art Davey. After repeated follow-up calls and persistent attempts to be included, UFC finally decided decided to say what the hell and give him a shot. Needless to say, it was the right choice. Severn quickly seared through the competition to earn a place in the UFC 4 final, where he would lose only to Hoist Gracie in a fight that he was winning until the bitter end. But he took it one step further at UFC 5, defeating Sambo Specialist, the aforementioned Oleg Taktarov, to become the first amateur wrestler to win a UFC tournament. Severn would then win the 1995 Ultimate Ultimate Tournament again later that year, and go on to defeat Ken Shamrock at UFC 9, claiming the UFC Super Fight Champion. The Beast paved the way for every amateur wrestler moving forward to have a professional career when choosing this as your athletic background meant Olympics or bust. You didn't make money any other way. And even then, it was only if you managed to somehow win. And why this is so important is that you absolutely have to know wrestling defense at a minimum in MMA or you will not achieve at the highest levels. That's just how it works. It's such a monumental change to the way people approach combat itself, and it's clearly evident with the litany of champions that MMA experiences now in every premier organization around the world. And we all have Dan Severn to thank for that. Number one, Hoist Gracie, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. This is perhaps the least shocking number one entry I've ever put on a list. No one could be surprised about this one. Who else could be deemed the most influential fighter in MMA history but Hoist Gracie? The entire premise of the UFC itself was based on pitting all the best martial arts in the world together, and when you look at what came out on top, it wasn't the one glove boxer, the suspect, heavily muscled shoot wrestler, the six foot four kickboxer, the larger than life sumo wrestler, or even the 6'5 Sabat specialist with a tooth lodged in his foot after his first fight. It was the 170 pound least intimidating guy with perhaps the least impressive physique that went through the entire competition like he was fighting children. From that day on, everyone had to know what jiu-jitsu was, and if you didn't know how to at least defend it, you were getting strangled. What happened that night changed martial arts forever on a global scale, and it all started with Hoist, because he was the first to put it all on the line on the world stage. Hoist was the one to put it on the map. He won every fight he had in the UFC in those days, including tournament titles for UFC 1, two, and four. What makes this different from almost all the other entries is that you don't have to know karate, taekwondo, or kickboxing. Just ask Damian Maya. But you damn sure have to know jujitsu if you want to fight professionally. Hoist Gracie is a legend, and without him and the Gracie family, we'd see a fundamentally different sport today. I'd like to personally thank Charlie Howard. You can follow him.
follow him on Twitter at MMA underscore Charlie for helping me and collaborating with me to write this list. And I'd also like to thank MJ Moore who edited this video. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom MJ Moore. Thanks for watching my list guys. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe and like. We upload at least three videos per week about MMA and it really helps us out when you do so. If I miss anything on this vid, let me know in the comments and feel free to follow me on Twitter at Jason the Heart or follow the official channel account at On Point MMA. Thanks for watching so much and I'll catch you on the next video. Who are sometimes incredibly brutal. The vast majority of the time when the final horn sounds, both fighters embrace to give each other credit for a job well done, acknowledging that regardless of the outcome, there is a mutual respect, even after some of the most brutal beatings. Today's list highlights the fighters that displayed the exact opposite. The disrespectful head scratch.